Welcome back on the AM show. We now talk inoculation, and uh, it's quite a saga developing. We're trying to find a solution to the current, uh, you know, discourse to the current situation we find ourselves in in terms of securing vaccines. We're joined on this conversation by Dr. Yaobe Diakon, uh, immunologist, I should say, with WACBIP uh, at the University of Ghana. Dr. Bediako, a very good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Benjamin. And let me just say we're immensely grateful to you. It's a very tight uh, rope you're running this morning. Thank you so much for making the time. So let's, let's start from uh, here. Over 842,000 jabs have been given. When you look at our case count currently, it stands at around 1,501. What would you say have been the gains and losses uh, in the current weeks, uh, maybe since the last time we spoke? What do you see? Um, I mean, I think it's it's great that we vaccinated the people we have vaccinated. However, it, you know, it's a very small proportion of the number that needs to be vaccinated. Um, obviously, the biggest the biggest hindrance has been access to vaccines, uh, which has proven to be maybe as or even more challenging than anticipated. Um, and largely, this is driven by the outbreak, you know, the scale of the outbreak in India which has now meant India is no longer a viable source for vaccines for the rest of the, you know, for us or for the rest of Africa, as had initially been anticipated. COVAX was expecting to get millions of doses of vaccines from the Serum Institute of India. That was a contract that had been established. Um, however, that has now dried up uh, because India is in the midst of probably the worst pandemic um, it has seen. Um, in many ways, the world has seen, given the scale of the, of the issue. Um, and so all their vaccine production is now domestic. Um, and so it means COVAX has no hope of getting vaccines from India. And really the only way, at least for AstraZeneca vaccine, that I think we are going to get in the near term is through surplus supplies from other countries. So the U.S. is releasing 60 million surplus AstraZeneca vaccines. I believe there are surplus supplies in Europe as well, I think in Canada. Um, so my hope is that either COVAX or maybe even probably more, a better idea of our government has to directly reach out to these countries and try to secure certain amounts of these vaccines. Um, expecting COVAX to deliver um, is a little bit, I think, um, risky because right now we're not sure how COVAX is going to be able to deliver, um, possibly through this surplus supply. But I think we need to start working, you know, our, we need to start working for ourselves and stop depending on these group initiatives. We need to start looking directly at our partners, leveraging diplomatic links with, you know, diplomats representing these countries in our country and see if some doses cannot be secured through bilateral agreements. Now, some people have said, Doc, that we should ramp up local production. At least that is what... Uh, they've said generally here we're yet to you know start any such initiative it is something we should be looking at you know addressing is it crucial now for us to locally produce some of these vaccines i mean the truth of the matter is in my opinion do we yes if you ask the question does ghana need vaccine production capacity definitely but you know production of vaccines is a highly technical highly complicated process that cannot be achieved within a few months. The vaccine production development for Ghana is for the next pandemic, not for this one. So to be honest, our, our approach right now has to be securing vaccines where we can find them. Um, do we need to put in place measures that we can begin to develop our own capacity? Certainly, but that capacity will take years to develop. Um, it cannot just be done overnight. So I think that is a second, in my opinion, that is a secondary focus. The primary focus right now is you have 800,000 people who have received one dose of a vaccine for which they require two doses. And you have another almost 19, over 19 million people who are required to be vaccinated and by our plan need to be vaccinated by the end of this year. Now that looks increasingly unlikely, but that is the first priority. First priority is vaccinating 20 million Ghanaians with vaccines wherever we can find them. And then once that has been done, putting in place the structures and the measures such that the next time something like this happens in the world, Ghana is much better prepared to solve, or at least to contribute to the effort locally.
Um, but I think the priority, the first priority has to be getting vaccines to people. And that is not going to be locally produced vaccine. That is going to be vaccines that we find from elsewhere. About 842,000 vaccinated. We've taken delivery of about another 200,000 do doses. Give or take, we're you know, going to inoculate about 1 million people. That's a drop in a bucket. We need, what, some 60 to 70 percent plus of the population to be vaccinated before we can even think about anything close to herd immunity. Now, some people have also spoken about the threat of a third wave. How imminent, how serious is that threat? And, and if we don't get things right, what could that mean for us? Um, well, in my opinion, it's hard to, you know, you don't want to be a prophet of doom. Um, but if you look at trends, over the course of this pandemic, what has happened in Ghana has mirrored what has happened elsewhere. When other countries had a second wave, we eventually had a second wave. Um, the from our airport about the number of positive cases being detected uh, is alarming because, you know, we are here to be those that we didn't even see in December. Um, we've hit levels that we didn't see in December. So, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, nobody does. But certainly we should have a heightened sense of um, uh, awareness and we should not be complacent. So, so, Doc, there are three crucial issues I want us to address very quickly. I, I know you're on a bit of a leash when it comes to time. The first one has to do with Mr. President's commitment. He is saying that he's personally going to spearhead this. The U.S. has given us some hope. Uh, but the fact is that other African countries also have vaccines that they've not used, some that they say have gone bad. And uh, there could be some suspicion that we may be willing to take in these vaccines. Would that be a prudent move? Well, we shouldn't take in expired vaccines. But vaccines that have not expired, that have been maintained properly, certainly, why not? If other countries are not in a position to use them up before they expire... We should be looking. I mean, right now, you know, right now it's, it's, it's a matter of, it, I wouldn't call it desperation, but in some ways it is a desperate situation. And, if, you know, Ghana, we have a pretty well-defined, well, well thought out vaccine mobilize, you know, vaccine deployment plan. All we need are the vaccines. So if other countries cannot use up the vaccines they have before they expire, we should be getting them and then be vaccinating people. Um, you know, we've done... We may have been close to a million, but that's a million people who've only received one dose. We have to revaccinate that whole million. So, so far, Ghana doesn't have anybody. Ghana so far, uh, Ghana so far doesn't have anybody fully vaccinated. That is something to keep in mind. Um, so we have, we have, we still have quite a bit of work. So, so touching on exactly that, it is very likely now that if you got your first AstraZeneca jab like I did, uh, you're going to now maybe have to move on to something else unless we can get more uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, wh what, what are the implications going to be? So are we going to have to start another entire phase, maybe with Sputnik V, uh, for example? And is it, is it impracticable to get Johnson & Johnson into Ghana, considering our climate conditions, considering our finances now? Because it appears we're willing to buy. So uh, two main issues in there. Uh, do you foresee that we're going to be forced to move away from AstraZeneca and start with another uh, vaccine? And would it be impossible, uh, as things currently remain, to get Johnson & Johnson? I don't think it's impossible to get Johnson & Johnson. In many ways, actually, the African Union has shifted its focus and is trying to get Johnson & Johnson. That also has the advantage of being a single-shot vaccine. Um, so I don't think it is I don't think it is, um, it, you know, it's it, inconceivable that we could go that way. Um, and in many ways, that might be the preferred option. Um, uh, but we have people who have received, you know, who have received the first dose. We need to give them the second dose. Possibly there is evidence suggesting that it could be Sputnik. Um, that might work, but the data is not out yet. So right now, we're a little bit of uncharted territory. I think the best, the best thing to do is to focus on getting whatever vaccines we can, um, initially AstraZeneca, to revaccinate the people who have received the first dose, and then, if necessary, to switch strategies and get new doses into people 
um, new vaccines, different vaccines into people. Um, certainly, Johnson & Johnson, I think, is one that we should consider very seriously um, and, and, and proceed from there. Do, do you feel we've planned well enough? Because we've had discussions in the past, Doc, and we had fears, and, and one of them is materializing now with, with the Indian uh, situation. Has our planning been good enough in, in terms of what is happening? I mean, I think that you can only plan so much. We, I think the plan was a good plan, but obviously everybody said that they had certain, there were certain risks. Unfortunately, the India pandemic has thrown a wrench into those plans. I don't think you can say we had a poor plan. We were just vulnerable, and that vulnerability is shared by many African countries see, in our own hands um, because of you know, the lack of local capacity. So I don't think you can say we haven't planned well. I think the plan was fine, but it's a plan based on a lot of factors that were beyond our control, and unfortunately, we're beginning to pay a bit of a price for that. But I think we can still be proactive, and we can still work hard to try to do everything that is possible to protect people. Before we take the way forward uh, from you, oh. I'd like you to react, and, and so these are the last two, I'd like you to react to what has happened at the KIA recently with Frontiers Healthcare, uh, you know, saying that they've actually seen the spike in cases. Uh, how do you react to that? Some have even called for the head of, uh, you know, the MD when it comes to the, you know, Ghana uh, airport company. I'm talking about uh, Yao Kwakwa. Uh, what is your reaction to that? Are we getting something fundamentally wrong at, at our major airport? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I'm not going to wade into any sort of political issues. I don't think we've got any, I mean, the testing... Uh, no, but it, it's a realistic is, issue. Is it's about if, if our numbers are increasing there, it, it, it the, obviously means there are certain things, whether from the outside or internally, that are allowing that to happen. Well, yes, but I don't think you can blame that on the airport. It's just that externally the numbers are rising, and so there are lots of positive cases. And so these cases are now you know, coming to our doorstep and are being detected. Um, I think that's all that it is. The PCR results elsewhere, yes, some may not be, may not be, you know, there may be some issues with PCR results taken elsewhere. But it's also because we have a 72-hour window, and so somebody could, you know, conceivably be negative when they take a PCR test and be and turn out to be positive when they arrive. So the fact that we are detecting this, you know, is at least a, you know, means that you know there is an increase in cases outside, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, I don't think you can say necessarily that there's something wrong at the airport. It's just that the airport is detecting cases coming in. And so we need to be aware that there are a lot of cases on our doorstep. I think that's what you can take. I don't think you can draw any further conclusions. Your, your final words, uh, Doc. What are you looking forward to as far as our campaign against COVID is concerned? Final words. I think we just have to, you know, we, we can't be complacent. Clearly, there's a lot of, you know, that, that we are not out of the woods at all. Um, we need to find ways to get vaccines into the country and vaccinate people as quickly as we can. Dr. Bediako, thank you so much. Immensely, immensely grateful for your time uh, this morning. Yeah. And, and just so all of you know, he's had to um, do quite some gymnastics to speak to others this morning. So we're very grateful. Dr. Bediako is with WACBIP at the University of Ghana.